Time to get started on the clinical applications, updates in medicine. We have a great panel up here for you, a lot of uh, stars in the medical cannabis industry uh, who work in everything from laboratory quality control, practicing of medicine, integrative medicine, award winners here. Um, and uh, if you could start by throwing up my uh, intro presentation, that'd be great. Um, so, uh, let's see, where are we in this program? No, just kidding. Um, so we have uh, Dr. Sue Sicily, um, uh, Marcel Von Miller, Dustin Sulak, and Michelle Sexton are all going to be presenting with you with some very interesting research. Um, Sue Sicily is probably pretty well known. Um, she needs no introduction, but I'm going to give one anyway. So, as some of you may know, she practices medicine in Arizona. She has won numerous awards, including letters of uh, commendation from both Clinton and Bush, um, as well as the Leo B. Hart Humanitarian Award for Outstanding Contributions for Social Reform. Um, she's also um, received the Arizona Medical Association's highest honor, the President's Distinguished Service Award, and she serves as a member at large for the American Medical Association Governing Council. She's probably best well known for her uh, research on the medical uses of uh, medical marijuana to treat PTSD in veterans. Um, she'll be uh, speaking shortly after me, followed by uh, Marcel uh, Bon Miller, who is a PhD also from Air, uh, uh, <laughs> Center for Innovation to Implement Implementation at the VA Palo Alto Healthcare System, as well as the Center of Excellence in Substance Abuse Treatment and Education at the Philadelphia uh, VAMC. Um, he, his, P, his PhD is looking at uh, PTSD and cannabis in individuals, and we'll be hearing more from him after Sue. Uh, Dustin Sulak is, uh, practices medicine in New England. He's probably best known for his integration of cannabis into complementary and alternative medicine. I like to think of this as, if you're thinking about chemotherapy, about using cannabis and conventional medicine to treat the disease. Uh, Michelle Sexton is also a distinguished member uh, of, the, of this panel. She's a naturopathic doctor and ec executive medical research director at the Center for the Study of Cannabis and Social Policy in Washington State. Um, she's also the founder and chief scientific officer at Phytolab, the first uh, Washington State cannabis testing facility. Um, she's also a contributor to the AHP monograph. She's one of the authors. Um, she probably, uh, what I was, one of the projects that I have most liked was her NIH funded research in Nephi Stella's lab where she looked at actually real cells from multiple sclerosis patients and looked at the effects of cannabis has in that population on actually their immune system. It was very fascinating work. So we'll be hearing, she'll be wrapping up the panel. Um, and what I'd like to start off you guys with is a short introduction to the endocannabinoid system and, and mutations in disease. Um, just to kind of, talk, they're going to be talking about treating humans. I'm going to be talking about cells and the mechanisms that may help explain why people get such a benefit from cannabis. Um, so, a uh, really short introduction to the endocannabinoid system. It was discovered with the help of plants, namely the cannabis plant, but it's not the only plant that makes cannabinoids. Uh, THC is only found on the cannabis plant, and its discovery and structural elucidation allowed lots and lots of synthetic versions to be uh, synthesized, which led to receptor discovery and all sorts of fun studies. And so we have a collection of cannabinoid receptors. The two most well studied are the CB1, CB2 receptor. We also have enzymes for their synthesis and breakdown of the endocannabinoids, anandamide and 2-AG. And so you have all these parts and players. You have receptors or proteins all over the body. You have natural THC-like compounds, anandamide to AG, that are produced by the body that stimulate these receptors. Um, and so what does this system do? There's a great uh, phrase coined by Vincenzo de Marzo and Rafael Mashulam. The system helps you to eat, sleep, relax, forget, and protect. And I think it was uh, Lynn Hallett or, or Patty Reggio who also said uh, cannabinoids uh, help you to keep you calm, cool, and collected. But if you use it too much, it makes you fat, dumb, and happy. <laughs> Um, so, and one of the reasons can, uh, cannabinoids and cannabis might work so well in diseases is that some people may have mutations or disruptions in their system in disease states. There's a w great paper called the, on the Clinical Endocannabinoid Deficiency by Ethan Russo, which 
discusses cannabis and treatment resistant conditions like fibromyalgia and migraine. Um, and these are a few pictures of some plants that also make cannabinoids, um, mostly CB2 agonists like beta crocoline and other random compounds. But it, the ibogaine tree also makes cannabinoids, which I found fascinating, as well as species of chrysanthemum and, and rhododendron. Uh, so this is a, a, a work in progress. Uh, this is a table uh, I'm working on for a book chapter in, in a neuropathology book. It's, so on the left hand, we can see in, in very blurry words uh, diseases, uh, endocannabinoid system activity, and then the references. And so in humans in mammalian models, they've looked at cirrhosis, heart failure, arthritis, um, pulmonary issues, obesity issues, us, um, which one was interesting was osteopathic manipulation, um, emotion sickness, and psychological stress. And they found that the endocannabinoid levels and even receptor expression levels are, are altered in various diseases. Um, so for instance, in obesity, they found that in animals, there's a lot of increase in anamide and 2-AG. Not really sure exactly why they're seeing this change. It just represents that something's out of balance. Um, and so I'm going to go into a little bit of the structure, because I like proteins a lot. Um, so uh, this is like what we would call a, a typical G protein receptor, which is a cannabinoid receptor. It has these, this is a cell wall on the outside of a cell, and the little, uh, has a little transmembrane helices that go through it. And this is just a schematic model. You know, cannabinoids are not receptors and proteins are not flat like a snake, like, you know, in the grass. They're, they're, um, they're, they're kind of bundled together and, and held together by electrostatic interactions. And being composed of only amino acids, if anything goes wrong, there's a mutation, the DNA sequence does not read the correct amino acid, you can lose these delicate electrostatic interactions that hold the protein together. Um, so this is another kind of bead on a string version of the cannabinoid receptor. Each one of these letters represents an amino acid. And you may know some amino acids. There's, there's tryptophan in there. There's cysteine. There's serine, lysine, arginine. Um, and many of these, these ones that are in red that you can barely see, are ones that are important for uh, letting the receptor move upon a drug binding it. So if you have mutations in some of these receptors or, or some of these uh, amino acids, you might predict that there would be a problem recognizing something like THC. And there is published research that shows that different parts of the receptor are important for different classes of drugs. We can use a very simple example, the indole derivatives, uh, which are a popular component of the drug spice, these, the uh, synthetic cannabinoids. Many of them actually require a different part of the receptor for activation and stimulation than anandamide and THC. Um, so this is a three-dimensional structure of the protein, just kind of getting deeper and deeper and deeper into the high-res images of what the receptor looks like. And the amino acids in the receptor are important for things like binding, activation, the structural change that happens when a drug binds, and the overall structure and um, uh, rigidity of the receptor. There are lots of different drugs and drug classes that you can look at to study these receptors. Uh, the other day I mentioned Ramonaban as uh, being kind of a failure in the clinic. It has been way more uh, useful as a research tool. I don't think any of my PhD research would have been possible without something that blocks the cannabinoid receptor to, to indeed study what happens when it goes wrong or to see how it competes with other drugs. Um, and so what has been looked at with CB1 receptor genetics is there's been a lot of interesting research in mammalian models, humans and animals. Um, so for instance, there's this, um, this sequence, uh, AAT repeat. So you have not just in the cannabinoid receptor parts of the gene that code for the structure of the protein, but also code its regulatory sequences. So how much of the receptor to make, how, where to make it, um, where to send it. Should it be expressed on the cell surface? Should it be expressed inside the cell? And so if you have a bunch of different versions of CB1 receptors floating around, um, and we'll show, I have a slide, some of them are actually, some of these splice variants or alternative CB1 receptors are very responsive to stress, such as a low oxygen environment, sort of kick-starts them. And other ones are not responsive. So talk about stress adaption, we can talk about cannabinoid receptor mutations. Um, but just real quick, uh, alterations in CB1 receptor expression and mutations have been correlated to various brain disorders like schizophrenia, substance abuse disorders, neurodegenerative disorders like Parkinson's disease, 
as well as depression, anxiety, and eating disorders. So there actually was a study that looked at mutations in the endocannabinoid system in a pool of anorexia and bulimia patients, and there's a population of them that uh, seem to have mutations in the cannabinoid receptor system. And I thought conceptually this made a lot of sense. If the system that's telling you to eat and digest food properly is not working, uh, you're going to have some problems eating. Uh, also what's interesting is the CB2 receptor, the immune receptor, has been shown in at least three different human populations in three different countries that uh, alterations of this receptor are correlated with weaker bones, so more severe age-related osteoporosis and weaker hand bone strength. Um, and so finding perhaps drugs that can interact with the cannabinoid receptor system when there are these mutations to restore the balance might be key to treating some of these um, treatment-resistant conditions. Uh, so these are some of the splice variants. I just wanted to throw this up there. It's a work in progress. There are five so-called CB1 splice variants. Um, uh, some of you may have some of these. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe as genetic testing becomes cheaper, you might be able to determine what sort of splice variants you have. But the CB1 type 4 splice variant appears to be the most interesting because it's very reactive to a hypoxic environment. So when you challenge it in a laboratory, in a mammalian model, in an animal model, this receptor seems to be turned on and expressed in the very stressful states. Uh, so the, some of these uh, receptor variants might be very important in responding to stress and adapting to stress where other variants may not arm you so well to deal with an insult or stress. So what's the overall goal of, of what we're doing here? So we know that CB1 receptors, like many other important <laughs> proteins, mutations are, are responsible for lots of diseases. I think GPCRs, um, the class that cannabinoid receptors belong to, constitute some thousands and thousands of diseases are, are underlying disruptions in these types of proteins. And so we have a lot of evidence emerging that you have variations of the CB1 receptor, perhaps altering how they interact with different drugs, whether it's endocannabinoids, THC, or synthetic ligands. Um, so with this basic research, the cannabinoid receptors or structure, specific amino acid residues have been identified, which give certain drugs their binding properties to these receptors. So you turn off part of the receptor or you delete an amino acid, you might lose the ability of THC to properly interact with the receptor. So the whole goal of this, though, is to develop what's called pharmacogenomics, which is matching basically the pharmacy to someone's genes. And so in the future, my hope is that we'll have a lot more information about people's endocannabinoid system as a mechanism to explain these treatment-resistant conditions and perhaps design, I don't know, some sort of phytotechnology solution to um, apply to with genetic information. So that's sort of my hope for the future and my update about applying what we know about the endocannabinoid system to a pharmacological approach. Um, and with that, if our panel is ready, <laughs> um, I'd like to bring up Sue Sicily and have her talk about some of the interesting things she's been doing. All right. I just kind of have to point it that way. Okay, got it. All right. Thank you guys so much for having me. Let's see, Jeff, if you can find my slides. Um, there you are. Um, I'm so grateful to be here, and I have been thrilled by the, the quality of these speakers and me meeting all of you and hearing your stories about your experiences using different formulations of marijuana. You taught me so much already. Um, I'm going to focus today on kind of our battle trying to get this study underway. And I'm hoping, I've been instructed that that would be helpful to you guys in your work ne next week meeting with these elected officials. Because then when they confront you with this whole, you know, the usual rhetoric about we need more science, we don't have enough research, and thus we can't move forward on any drug policy reform, um, then you can explain to them the very real barriers to this work and why, you know, and use this um, as an example of how uh, marijuana research, at least efficacy research in this country has been systematically impeded. So let me see here. I'm going to just briefly, I've lived in Scottsdale about 30 years. I, I practice internal medicine and psychiatry there. 
I, um, I actually did, I, I first got to work with veterans during my residency training and immediately was enchanted by them. I've been able to care for them now for about 20 years since then. I did stay around the VA after residency. I was moonlighting there for a few years, but the system was so dysfunctional that I couldn't tolerate it. So I moved into private practice, continued seeing vets, um, on in, in my indigent clinic on a sliding scale, and then I would um, work end up working half time at the U of A until I got fired. So that was in June uh, when I left there. But I was I was there at the U of A for about five years. And I want you to hear my disclaimers. Right, I've never tried marijuana personally in any form. I'm I, I know it's sad. <laughs> I know there's a lot of people here who could help me with that. Um, I never, I don't qualify, you know, patients for cards. I'm not, you know, I don't own dispensaries or stocks in the industry. I just care about the science. And here's uh, an example of this very subversive work that we were trying to do for the last few years. We had the, the audacity to, to propose doing an FDA approved study looking at whole plant marijuana in veterans with PTSD. And you'll see here, I'm gonna, we're very um, honored to have our coordinating PI here. Marcel is gonna talk to you more in depth about our protocol next. But I'll just briefly share with you, this is basically what we were trying to do, was look at these four varieties of smoked marijuana in, in veterans with uh, combat-related trauma. And let's see here. And I just want to give you a timeline. Of, you know, this is fairly typical for how marijuana efficacy research is, is handled in the U.S. So you can see that our, our protocol was submitted to the FDA in 2010. And I want to emphasize that the FDA was not the blockade in this process. So they actually worked collaboratively with us and tried to refine the study design until just really a few months later, they approved our protocol. In April 2011, our study was approved, and MAPS, my sponsor, immediately sent that protocol, the, the approval letters to the DEA, NIDA, to the Public Health Service to start that review process. Um, and you can see here, there's tons of media fanfare. That's Rick Doblin, who you heard yesterday, but he's the director of MAPS. Here he is, you know, tons of, of media attention about the fact that, you know, celebrating the fact that we finally get to study marijuana for PTSD. But this article is dated spring of 2011, and we still have not implemented this study in 2015. So here, here's, I'm going to give you some insight into how all this happened. So in, at, right after I got FDA approval, I go back to the University of Arizona and I say, hey, I've got FDA approval. And they say, whoa, that is illegal. You are not going to do that on campus. And they say the only way, and I, I provided them with all kinds of legal opinion showing that this is a federally regulated, federally legal study, and they didn't care. And they said the only way you're going to do this is if you run a bill through the legislature, because they knew that that would dissuade us and we'd probably run, run away. But I'm, you know, we're not afraid of the legislative process. So we, we did exactly what they asked. We embarked on uh, SB 1443. It took us a year to get through this process, but we went and developed language that would enable the universities to feel comfortable to house this research on campus, despite you know, a statewide ban of recreational marijuana. Here was the exception language. And um, I'm just gonna show you. So what happened is during that year process of trying to um, get through uh, the, the legislature, all the hurdles there, we end up, um, we decided to apply to the IRB. We said, Let, let's, let's tackle that next. And so after months of back and forth with the University of Arizona IRB, we end up getting approval in 2012, which is very exciting. And I again go back to the U of A and I say, hey, We've got FDA approval and IRB approval. Can I get some lab space now? Because I, I need to get my DEA Schedule One license, and the only way to get that is to, you know, have an exact location where they can inspect. And of course, U of A says, "Whoa, no, it's still illegal. The bill hasn't passed, and we're we're not comfortable with this." And so again, you know, we go back to the legislature, spend all legislative session. I have all these lobbyists working in coalition with each other, and we get this thing passed. In, in 2013, the governor signs this bill after it passes almost unanimously through both houses because everybody knew that it was just a reaffirmation of existing law. 
And uh, we end up, I'll show you here. Now this is my president, President Hart, um, who uh, unfortunately, this is, I really like this quote from Albert Einstein because I think he says it well, that you know, this is my philosophy. I talk to everybody the same way. I don't care if they're the garbage man or the president of the university. And I told her, hey, if I was a cancer researcher, I'm pretty sure I would have had a lab by now. If I was studying the life cycle of the caterpillar, I bet we would have had a lab within two months of IRB approval. But no, there was no space for us because they did not like the optics of having veterans smoking marijuana on campus. They could not handle that in Arizona. So here, we'll show you, oh, so then we, we decided, okay, we're gonna play, we're gonna embark on the political process. We're gonna become players and raise money and write checks to politicians, and maybe that'll change the game for us. So we go and we start this pack, and I'm the chair. So suddenly the UVA's really upset now because I'm the chair of a political committee that is advocating for marijuana research, for ending the barriers to this research. And so the UVA says, um, excuse me, can you please step down as chair and disband this PAC because you're a government employee and we don't want government employees involved in political activity. And I said, you know, I'm half time. I'm half time, I'm allowed to do this in my non-university work hours. By the way, we raised a bunch of money from the physician community. We could not give away one dime of this. Not one, one candidate would accept a pack check from us because it, we were working on eliminating barriers to marijuana research and they didn't want to touch it. So um, then we moved back and suddenly um, the public health service stunned us by, by approving our study back in uh, last year, in March of 2014. And again, an avalanche of media attention and the U of A suddenly becomes very scared because now they're you know, unable to deal with all the media scrutiny and um, they decide, let me show you. Um, oh yeah, so then the veterans get active so this was a big, um, a big achievement because I hadn't seen in all my years in Arizona, I'd never seen veterans becoming politically active. And suddenly they formed this committee and they started um, investigating a really interesting situation that you know we have all these medical marijuana states now. Many of them have surplus money. And in our case, in Arizona, our $9 million surplus was voter protected, right? So this, this surplus accumulated over years. You know, we've had medical marijuana law now over four years. So just by selling cards to cardholders and picking up dispensary license fees, we accumulated nine million bucks and the legislature couldn't touch it. So they were mad. They could not sweep this money because it required a three-fourths vote of both, of both houses. So instead of you know, trying to uh, embrace the, the veterans' idea was, hey, why don't we use this for research? This makes a lot of sense. And, and they created a whole campaign on social media. They went to the, they went to the Capitol. They held rallies. It was incredible. And, uh, and rather than you know, being proud of these vets for exercising their civil rights, um, this uh, is what we found, is we found a legislator, you can see her name up there, Senator Kimberly Yee, decided to run a competing bill to say that we don't want this money used for research, we want it used for marijuana prevention. And, and the, their, what their mechanism was called marijuana harmless, think again not harmless, and they were gonna go around, they have this you know, statewide crusade where they go around brainwashing elected officials about the dangers of marijuana, and, and you, it, they won't even show us the data because you know, they don't wanna inv invite any uh, scientists or anyone into the room who might question the validity of their data. So only elected officials are invited to these. And they wanted all of that $9 million surplus to go into their prevention program, which targets youth and adults, telling them how bad marijuana is. And here's, and so finally, under all this media scrutiny, the U of A crumbled and said, you know what, we're gonna give you space, okay, okay, fine. Here's your space. You get this space that is so far off campus that nobody will know you're associated with the U of A. This is a dilapidated office that has asbestos throughout the ceiling and floor. Here's another couple pictures. This is what they offered. They took me on a tour of this space and said, this is what your veterans get. This is what our revered veterans get to sit there and inhale marijuana in this place. Um, so 
you can imagine that I was at odds with the administration at the U of A, which resulted in um, you know a ton of, this is the Senator Kimberly Yee, this is how this bill ended, right? Kimberly Yee was the chair of the education committee. She cut off the, um, the discussion by, you know, she was uh, refused to allow the bill to have a hearing. And so she became an enemy to the veterans in Arizona. She's now linked to hundreds of media articles saying that she's anti-veteran. But this woman was the rising star in the Republican Party, and she hammered this bill into the ground and ruined it for all of us. So, um, so she's now um, really struggling. But you can imagine that this resulted in me being fired. So I, I was terminated. I had all three of my contracts stripped from me back in June of last year. There was, again, a flurry of media attention for months, um, just relentless um, interest from the media about how did this happen? And everybody knew, even though the U of A insisted, we non-renew contracts all the time. This isn't unusual. This had nothing to do with Dr. Sisley. Her performance has been excellent. This is just, you know, we just, you know, budget issues, we non-renew. But then a deeper investigation by New Times, which they spent three months looking at this and asking lots of questions, and they came up with what is what really happened, which is Senate president did not like what was happening, the political activism. This is the same Senate president who put an amendment into a bill. He buried it on like page, you know, page 20 here where nobody would see it, saying that no general fund money would ever go to support marijuana research at a public university. And so I was lucky that one of our friends is a legislative analyst at the Capitol who found this for me and sent it to me. And of course, I sent it out to all the media. And I said, look, this is the true colors of this guy. This is what he's trying to do, unacceptable. And the media rained down on him and he immediately withdrew this amendment. And thank goodness it never got approved because it, it could have suppressed marijuana research at universities for years. And, um, and But ever since then, this man has been gunning for me. The Senate president has said on the record that he believes all marijuana research is just a strategy to promote legalization. So this is what we're dealing with in Arizona, these ex extremists. But the best thing that came out of this was that we started seeing the barriers to marijuana research on display in the media for months and months. And the, and the very best thing was that people started talking about 22 a day. So you can see on the front cover of this, which, you know, it's not sexy, it doesn't sell papers, but finally they're starting to talk about this epidemic of veteran suicide. And that was, you know, uh, the, the big gift that came out of my getting fired was we started shining a light on this. And I, I think that, um, let me see, I, I actually wanted to mention this. The veterans asked me to, they, they sent these dog tags instead of a, a ribbon campaign. They're trying to build awareness with these dog tags that say 22 on. I think every, all the veterans here know that 22 is actually a low estimate. And we all realize that this is, you know, that there are a number of suicides that get labeled accidents, and this number is probably much higher. But this is already a horrific number. And any of you who want this, the veterans are shipping out a bunch of these dog tags that on Monday that you can take with you into your um, congressional and Senate offices so that you can um, share this awareness with these folks here. Um, I think, uh, so yeah, suddenly I'm being whisked around to all these different news outlets. I don't know what is going on. Now, Gupta is, you know, our best friend now. And, you know, he got all this. But the best thing is, so the New, New York Times does an in-depth piece also, and they decide that uh, they, they uncover the smoking gun, which is Senate president says, yeah, I called, I called the UVA because I thought that Dr. Sisley was behaving, you know, was advocating too aggressively. And, um, and yeah, I called the chief lobbyist and he said, uh, what did it say? We are take, it, this shouldn't be a problem going forward, like the mafia or something. <laughs> she should not be a problem. And the, yeah, they're right. They took, her, they took care of me, all right? And uh, <laughs> so, let me see here. So um, let's see. So yeah, and then the veterans again started rampaging and got this, you know, Ricardo, who couldn't be here, unfortunately, but he's been a champion there, got this change.org petition, got a, like 110,000 signatures in two weeks. It was am amazing. But still, the U of A refused to reinstate me or the research, just uh, adamant. 
And the other great thing was we had a lot of kind of high profile people coming out of the woodwork. Let me show you Andy Weil, right? So Andy had the same experience at the U of A when he started there. He didn't get fired, but he was close. And so he was very sympathetic to our plight. And he, of course, wrote a public letter, you know, an open letter to the media and to President Hart condemning her decision. And I was really proud of him for, for doing that, really honored. Yeah, it was great. Yeah. And then since then, we've been totally blackballed. That's what this is the front page of Westward, where they talked about the fact that I've been blackballed from all the universities. All three state universities have walked away from this work. They won't do it. Um, let me see if I can get the next one. Oh, and then here's, uh, you know, we've talked a ton about the scheduling of, of controlled substances in the US. But I did want, because Rick Doblin is here, and he was, uh, regrets that he didn't get to tell you about why rescheduling marijuana would not fix the research problem. So I just want to just highlight briefly why this is so important for you to be aware of. So, and just to go over, you guys all know the definition, schedule one, you know, no medical benefit, but you may not have seen the whole list lately. So I wanted to show you, this is the full list. Um, and what's interesting to me, if you look at Schedule 4, the DEA, remember, the DEA law enforcement professionals are defining what has medical benefit or not. And so they've listed in Schedule 4, which is defined as having high medical benefit and low addiction potential, drugs like Xanax and Ativan, all things that we know have very high street value. Um, yeah, so... I would say, um, and then here, now this is the most important. So you were talking about two obstructions to research that will not be fixed by rescheduling marijuana, to schedule two or five or any of them. These two barriers must be eliminated independently of rescheduling. The NIDA monopoly, so not, the National Institute on Drug Abuse has a government enforced monopoly on the only legal supply of marijuana for any FDA approved trials. It, it's the only Schedule One drug that has to deal with this absurd system, a NIDA monopoly, a public health service review. No other Schedule One drug has to deal with this. DEA licenses this facility at University of Mississippi back in 1968. If NIDA doesn't like your study, they can refuse to sell you study drug, and then your, it's, your study is impossible to conduct. And that's what you know, scientists looking at efficacy of marijuana generally get put into this situation, into a permanent review process where they never emerge. And here are the two barriers, right? Public health service review and NIDA monopoly. Um, here it is. I, I put it side by side just so you could see crystal clear how ridiculous it is. It's marijuana. So if you want to study heroin, you go through these three agencies. If you want to study marijuana, you go through these two additional layers that have no timeline. So they could take years. And why do we want to study this? It's obvious, right? We got so many patients around the country suffering from PTSD, so many vets coming back with uh, this illness. We've got, you know, the drug treatment that is currently available is really disappointing. And we've got more and more media outlets talking about this, which has been really helpful. This actually was painted by a veteran. The original artwork is over at the Baker Institute on Public Policy at Rice University. This veteran, I mean, does that depict it any, you know, could that be any more accurate? Veterans drowning in pills and pill bottles and grabbing on to a joint to save their life. I, here's the only two FDA approved meds on the market for PTSD, that's it. You got Zoloft and Paxil. So if you want, you know, I use Paxil. I don't know how many other docs in the room use Paxil. I, I mean, when I take care of pedophiles in the correctional department, that's what we give them is Paxil to suppress their libido and make them, you know, uninterested in, you know, so here these veterans are coming back home wanting to reintegrate in their families and all, they get these meds that cause them weight gain and sexual dysfunction, all these problems. And really, you know, here's the bottom line. This study that Marcel is about to tell you about is gonna, is, is the only randomized controlled trial looking at whole plant marijuana for PTSD. That's why this is so crucial to get this thing underway. And you know, this is really important, right? The Public Health Service Review delayed our study for three years for no reason. They didn't offer, you know, they didn't mandate any protocol changes. They just suppressed this work. And, that, and during that time, 24,000 veterans killed themselves in this country. 
and that is unconscionable. So we need to end this public health service review. This is the problem. These agencies don't have any timeline. So unlike the FDA, which is a joy to work with because they're on a 30-day timetable, so they have to respond in a month. These other agencies, NIDA, DEA, um, public health service have no timeline, so they can take 10 years if they want. And um, basically, I'm, uh, this is about uh, the end of it here, but um, basically, uh, let's see, let's see. Um, yeah, so basically, a public health service review um, delays the study. Let me just jump in here. Um, that we, um, yeah, this is the other problem. I'm going to just show you real quick a picture of the marijuana from NIDA so you can see. They don't have any track record of growing CBD rich marijuana until our. Our study protocol, you know, forced them to start learning to grow this. And here's pictures from Ethan, actually, was nice enough to share these. This is what they do. So they, they take the entire plant, they throw it into a grinder. He's got his hand, this is Dr. El Soli, got his hand in a barrel of ground up marijuana. And it ended up getting rolled up to, and it, when you unroll the contents, that's what you get. A lot of leaf, stems, sticks, seeds. Um, so this is what, yeah, this is what we're forced to work with. So that's why it's so important when you guys get on Capitol Hill to talk about this and make sure that your elected officials know what research is forced to deal with. This is the Controlled Substances Act. It says that the NIDA monopoly is supposed to provide a continuous and uninterrupted or an adequate and uninterrupted supply of marijuana. We would uh, submit they've already failed at that. It's been you know, over a year and we still don't have study drug. And uh, that's it. ARMA has been, you know, Arizona Medical Associate, I was talking to Larry earlier, these organized medicine is starting to understand that we have to end the barriers to marijuana research. And, uh, and, and I was just going to mention one other thing real quick, that um, this is part of what, um, just, just recently we got public health service um, uh, permission to do the study, right? I mean, I'm, excuse me. Um, j just last week, I got IRB approval from a, a private IRB, right? So none of the universities would accept this, so I end up uh, applying to Copernicus, and we get our approval. And it's a big media story now in Arizona because they're excited that we're proving that we don't need the universities. And so they're reporting on this. But one interesting thing that they said was that I was um, fired because my contract with the, this grant had come to an end. And I think it's really important for you guys to be aware, this was the, the grant that I had. This was one of three contracts that I had with the UVA. This was you know, a $300,000 grant to educate doctors statewide about the, the, the medical marijuana law in Arizona. Very dangerous, right? Because if medical marijuana law is you know, information about the law is imparted to doctors in a, in a neutral and conservative way that might actually, at, you know, persuade MDs and DOs to join the program and to certify patients. That's very scary to the opponents of this. So, in fact, we were only, this shows you, we were only, this was a three-year fully funded grant. The U of A turned the money back in after five months. We hadn't even launched the grant yet. We had just started, and I'll show you just real quick because I, Steph had asked me, this is what we were taking around. We had a speaker's bureau of physicians that was supposed to be training doctors. We were doing a pretest, um, looking at, you know, helping them understand. But you can see here, basically, this is, let me show you. This is what we were trying to do, was talk to them, hey, this is what a card looks like. This is what your certification form looks like. You know, this is how patients can qualify. And it was like, you know, it was so straightforward. It wasn't trying to persuade them to join the, the movement. It was just saying, hey, this is the law. This is how you can safely participate without affecting your license. And you can see why this had to be suppressed, because they don't want physicians learning about that process. So anyway, thank you all very much. I appreciate it. All right. Yes, give it up for Sue Sicily. All right, and now you guys are in for another really big treat. Um, our next speaker has focused his career on understanding the interrelationship between PTSD and cannabis. He has something like 100 peer-reviewed publications, 50 of which have focused on this subject. So please give a warm welcome to uh, Dr. Marcel Von Miller. Hey, everybody. 
How's it going? Good. There we are. So um, I'm going to talk kind of concurrently about what's been going on in the research field for um, marijuana and PTSD, kind of leading up to this joint collaboration um, that Sue was talking about. Um, and then also tell you about another study that we're doing. Um, actually, I can talk to you about two other studies that are going on simultaneously that should really help us understand what's going on with marijuana and PTSD to a fuller extent. Um, so first, I'm just going to talk a little bit about co-occurrence, right? So how many people are using marijuana? And among those, how many people have PTSD? So this was a study. I'm going to talk about my work, but I'll also mention other work that's been going on, because this has been a collaborative among a lot of researchers in the field. This is a study we did in San Francisco. This was the top 10 conditions for which um, people reported that they were using medical marijuana. They're overlapping categories, so that's why it adds up to more than 100%. People are using for lots of different reasons. As you see here, um, PTSD was about 20% of folks reported using for PTSD specifically. We're seeing these numbers in about, about this rate um, in lots of other studies that have been done. Mark Ilgen has done it in Michigan. Other folks, including Amanda Ryman, has, have done it in California. There's some new studies that have come out of Rhode Island. So pretty much a, a general profile of what we're seeing across the board. Um, We've also looked epidemiologically. So we, they have these big um, samples of folks in the US um, where they've asked about marijuana use, they've asked about all sorts of different disorders, uh, PTSD included. And we've looked at these large samples. This one, I think, um, was in the four to five thousands. And here we saw pretty much across the board a strong association between PTSD and cannabis use. So folks that um, reported PTSD both in their lifetime, currently also had higher rates of cannabis use um, both lifetime history as well as past year and even daily marijuana use. These are the hot off the presses um, numbers from the VA. This um, is half my job is at the Department of Veterans Affairs. This is among folks with PTSD. This is the rates of illicit substance use disorders. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about to contextualize this, because uh, most of my work has been looking at cannabis use disorders. So those folks that have gone on to develop problems associated with cannabis use, and how can we intervene? VA only tracks cannabis use disorders. They don't track cannabis use. We're working on that. But um, right now, this is 2002 to 2014. As you see here, since 2009, Cannabis has been the primary um, substance used by folks with PTSD, illicit substance used by folks with PTSD, and it's steadily rising. So that's this line right here. Um, cocaine, actually, surprisingly, was number one beforehand. Um, when we look at kind of break down individual years, and these, the numbers that I'm presenting are full samples. This is every single person that's been seen in the VA each year. Well, these aren't representative samples or anything, it's just everyone, um, which we're very fortunate to have these crazy data sets. Um, this, is, this was a snapshot from um, 2009. These are among people with cannabis use disorders. These are the um, co-occurring psychiatric problems that they're facing. So 71% of folks um, have a psychiatric disorder, and here the highest of which um, is PTSD. So about 30% in 2009, which is the last time I took a look at this, 30% of folks um, that have had, that have heavy cannabis use um, report having PTSD. And we also know that um, even the numbers that I showed just before are relatively um, low. So our estimates, a lot of clinicians within VA are not asking about people's cannabis use or whether they're developing problems with cannabis use. Um, as well as um, it appears PTSD was actually slightly underdiagnosed. This is a, a comparison of structured interviews that we gave folks and then we looked at their medical records. So all this to say that my work and kind of this simultaneously has been going on is just really trying to understand folks with PTSD, their associations and use of marijuana, why they're using marijuana, and this, and trying to my work primarily trying to understand the subset of folks that have developed cannabis dependence, have had difficulty stopping using, and try to intervene with those folks. This has then taken a left turn recently, which we'll talk about, but um, what we found pretty much across the board is that cannabis users with PTSD are using 
to cope with their symptoms. Not too, too surprisingly, but there wasn't a whole lot of um, documented evidence there. And it's primarily what we see is that they're using to cope with their sleep problems. Um, folks with PTSD, including veterans, are using primarily to help initiate sleep, help sleep through the night, because a lot of, one of the biggest symptoms of PTSD, right, is sleep difficulty, um, insomnia, nightmares. Um, and so we see this strong connection, and that's why people reported using, and then, but some people can manage that fine using you know, just enough to get them through you know, as a medication, but other people are developing problems. And here we see that um, people with PTSD specifically who have problems, again, report higher levels of coping, um, and they also have more withdrawal when they try to stop using. So they just have real difficulty um, switching over to something else if they you know, um, want to. So we know, so I'm just gonna shoot through a, a few studies here. This was um, looking at um, PTSD. So this traditional PTSD treatment within the VA, which is we had a sample of um, folks in residential treatment. So this is a 90-day residential treatment program. They use cognitive behavioral therapy, kind of like your traditional therapy. Um, and what we see is that folks who aren't doing well during the course of treatment don't find that their symptoms are getting better. They're turning to marijuana after. There are a lot of people um, that who aren't reporting, you know, kind of your traditional therapy, doing better during your traditional therapy. About 50% of them who used marijuana before treatment return to marijuana after treatment. Um, what most interestingly was that um, about 10% of folks who had never used marijuana before they went into treatment turned to marijuana after treatment. So they kind of found that the kind of existing treatment protocols weren't working for them. And so this kind of gets, gets at the, uh, the crux of the situation, right? That there, that there are a host of great treatment options for PTSD that aren't marijuana, right? Very well empirically supported, strong, strong evidence, but doesn't work for everybody. And so there's this subset of folks for whom it doesn't work that are moving on and using marijuana and finding that to be more effective. The problem is, is that kind of balance between using it to medicate at a reasonable level and then kind of those folks that develop problems. And so this is the complex picture of it. Um, and this gets at the, this was a study we recently completed. Um, the orange line are folks with PTSD. The white line are folks without PTSD. We had them come in the door. These were all heavy marijuana users and we said try to quit. And a lot of these folks were coming in the door reporting that they had problems with use and that they wanted to stop. These were people that you know, this is kind of, again, the other end of the spectrum, and I'm providing the sobering context for the, for the conference, I guess, but, right, there is a whole spectrum, right, and for some people it's problematic. These are folks who have found that it's problematic that have cannabis use disorders. And as you see, during at least the initial four weeks, folks with PTSD had significantly more problems um, reducing their use. Now it levels off, and the difference between week, month two through six, there's no difference. So, Eventually, over time, they can get there, but initially during the first four weeks, which is really when withdrawal happens with marijuana, um, they're experiencing problems as well. We see it on the flip side. So if you have, um, this is a, tr a treatment study where we had folks at entry, do you have a cannabis use problem? Um, are you a heavy user? Now you have to stop because all residential treatments, um, there's been some change, but within the VA, um, PTSD residential treatments um, had required abstinence throughout the course of treatment um, because like any other illicit drug as this is classified, and again, there's been some changes to this now um, within the VA um, rules, which I won't get into, but folks who were asked to stop cannabis um, prior to treatment had significantly worse time during treatment. So. I, Again, speaking to the idea that this may be beneficial for a subset of the population. Um, and if you essentially take away their medicine and then throw them into a traditional treatment, they don't do too well. So um, just to highlight just kind of areas of research, this is, there's a bunch of kind of ways of intervening for these folks that have cannabis dependence and PTSD. One of them is sleep. So if you have folks that haven't gone through traditional sleep treatments, trying to provide traditional sleep treatments to see if that works, right? If they haven't gotten the kind of best line defense of sleep 
Exercise is another one. There's amazing work happening in exercise right now that exercise activates the endocannabinoid system with similar pathways um, as is, acti as is um, done with marijuana. So exercise might serve as a replacement for folks that are having difficulty using. Um, and also fo focusing on other, like abil one's ability to um, regulate emotions, tolerate distress, um, are all kind of factors and ways of intervening um, for those folks that have developed problems with marijuana um, who also have PTSD. This brings us to today. So all this work was going on. This is, it's, it's funny, the marijuana PTSD work, thanks, um, has really didn't begin until there was a paper in 1996 by Bremner. There were a couple of papers in 2000 by Vla, Dave Vlahov, um, Dean Kilpatrick, that just were kind of like big samples that said, hey, there are a bunch of people with PTSD that are also using marijuana. Um, we didn't start our work in this area until 2007 where we started documenting that people are using marijuana specifically to cope with their symptoms and then trying to break that down. And again, this was common knowledge, I think, in subsets of the population, but wasn't really documented in the scientific literature. Um, so this is, again, pretty new in terms of the field. Um, and again, with my hat on, really focusing on those, those veterans that come knocking at the door saying, for one reason or another, they're having problems with their marijuana use and they have PTSD. How can we help them out? Which is most of what I just talked about. There's also those folks that do just fine with it. And that's the flip side of the coin. And trying to understand more specifically what it is, um, what type of marijuana is most helpful for them and how it is beneficial in, in terms of what symptoms specifically. So about this, um, maybe a little bit later, summer or so of last year when all this stuff was happening with Sue, I reached out to Rick and said, because um, I'd been doing most of this work in PTSD and marijuana, but hadn't really been aware, aside from a, a newspaper clipping or so, of what was going on um, in Arizona. When I heard that she got fired, I reached out to Rick um, and said, maybe there's a, a point of collaboration here. Um, you know, because there were really two camps that had kind of existed, and I thought it really makes sense to bridge that gap. There are a lot of kind of marijuana researchers out there that are, you know, just studying disordered use, and that's a lot of what gets funded. And then there's the kind of the pro camp or the other side of it that are kind of looking at the benefits of it. And there hasn't been a whole lot of collaboration between the two. So Rick came out um, as part of another trip and we sat down at the VA in Palo Alto and um, chatted about, is there a way that we could make this work together? Started to come up with a plan, did a redesign a little bit of, of Sue's initial protocol that she talked about. Um, pulled in Ryan Vandry, who's at Johns Hopkins, also an amazing researcher in this area. Um, and all this time, as we're starting to kind of craft this and try to figure out what makes sense, this call for proposals came out from Colorado. Perfect timing. Um, this was money that was brought in, um, it's kind of similar to Arizona, that was brought in for, um, from licensing fees, et cetera, through, through Colorado. $9 million, I think, or something like that, um, they were putting up for research. I believe it was something like 50-ish um, applications ended up going in in October. Um, eight, eight or nine were awarded, um, and we got two of them, which is really exciting. Um, the first of which Sue talked about, this is in collaboration with MAPS. Sue is doing one of the sites in Arizona. Ryan Vandry's doing the other site, Johns Hopkins. We're gonna take veterans with PTSD who have been treatment resistant, right? So those folks that didn't do well during that residential PTSD treatment as an example, and turn to marijuana afterwards. We're gonna bring those folks in, give them four different types of marijuana. So high THC, high CBD, high um, CBD, low THC, equal amounts CBD and THC in a placebo. And we're gonna to try to see, you know, like very beautifully designed, I think, um, with the help of Ryan and other folks, um, protocol, and just really try to see in a crossover design what's most beneficial. Right, so not only across the board is marijuana helpful, but is there certain types, right? Is, it, is, is there a balance between THC and CBD that's helpful or not? Um, and we're gonna be looking here at PTSD. As Sue mentioned, we're gonna be looking at suicide. Um, and we're also gonna look at negative consequences. We're really trying to take this from the full, you know, non-biased perspective here, just really letting the science do the job. Um, but really excited about this, and as Sue's mentioned, we've almost got all of our approval, approvals through. We're pretty close to starting, hopefully, in the summer on this, and this will be a three-year study. And sim simultaneously, for the same call, I wrote another grant um, that was an observational study, and it was meant to kind of 
mirror and fit in all the um, pieces that weren't being provided by the administration study. So big problem with the administration study, as Sue mentioned, was that you're using marijuana from NIDA, right? And that's not that great. And it's not what people are getting in the dispensary. So why not get people that already are getting marijuana from dispensaries, asking them what they use, sending it out for testing, get all the cannabinoids down, and trying to see how that and those numbers and that marijuana impacts their symptoms. And also, thank you. Another downside on the administration study is we only had a six month follow up. Um, and so here we put a one year follow up. So we say we're gonna expand the time. In terms of a number of folks, 76 people in this study, which is all that we could do. I mean, it's such a complex study. This is significantly simpler. Um, here we got 150 people that we're gonna go through it. There was just veterans. Here we're doing everybody with PTSD, not just veterans. Um, we're gonna do, um, and here are similar outcomes, PTSD, suicide, functioning, as well again as the um, negative consequences associated with use. This is all, this study, different from the um, study Sue was talking about, this is gonna be all conducted in Denver um, and surrounding areas. Um, so, and here we have, um, as I'm wrapping up, we have PTSD, folks with PTSD, half of whom when they start the study are users, and half of whom are not. And what we're gonna do over time is compare their trajectory of symptoms, right? To see if the users do better, improve on their PTSD symptoms versus the non-users. But most exciting is we're gonna look at initiation and remission. So if, the, if among the non-users, somebody decides, hey, I wanna try marijuana out, we can in the moment see what happens to their PTSD symptoms when they start using marijuana, um, and, and the marijuana that they get in dispensaries, which is pretty cool. And then similarly, on the flip side, if there's somebody with PT PTSD who uses marijuana at study start and decides that they wanna stop for one reason or another, we can see how that stopping affects their symptoms over time. So really trying to fill in all the gaps. Finally, um, simultaneously, I think this is my last slide, so, um, I've been in work um, collaborating, and I'm a co-investigator in the a study up in Canada with Tilray, um, and we're doing, for this first administration study, we're doing a replication in Canada, which is all happening simultaneously. It's been a busy few, um, few months, but um, so we're among about half the sample, I believe it's low 40s, um, and all veterans, or not, sorry, all folks with PTSD, specifically trying to focus on veterans and um, first responders, um, and we're gonna to try to match um, the concentrations of marijuana. This in Canada works differently, so this is marijuana that's being provided by Tilray. It doesn't have, it's higher quality than stuff that we get from NIDA. Um, similar outcomes, and, and so I've been working with them. I was just up there in January, and we're about to start that one as well. So a whole bunch of data that's gonna come in that should answer this question on both sides, both how is it helpful for folks, and then among folks that use it, you know, maybe at problematic levels are there ways of intervening. So. That's the snapshot of what's going on. Super exciting. All three, Canada's a two-year study, the other two are three-year studies. So that should give you a timeline of where we're at. But thank you so much. Thank you so much. All right, our next speaker is uh, Medical Practices in New England. I've enjoyed always seeing this guy s speak. He has a background in nutrition and biology, and so his medical practice is about integrative healthcare, not just trying to stuff his patients with a cornucopia of schedule two through five. Um, so please welcome the very talented health professional, Dustin Sulek. Oh, his, his mentor in medical school was Dr. Andrew Weil, by the way. All right, thank you everyone for having me here today. I'm quite excited to share some uh, material with you from our practice in New England. Uh, what we're doing there is helping patients and trying to figure out solutions to the problems that the patients are bringing in, solutions that haven't been provided by the conventional mainstream medicine. Uh, one of the greatest tools that we have to work with is cannabis, but we are also working with other open-minded uh, approaches to helping our patients. Let's see. Uh, so just some uh, demographics about my practice. I work with uh, seven other physicians, nine nurse practitioners, uh, a licensed professional counselor, napperpath, acupuncturist. You can see that most of our patients are in the age range of 30 to 69, but we also treat minors and elderly. And uh, this is uh, the primary uh, diagnosis for the patients from our main practices. 
And I think um, if it's too small for some of you to read, let's see, how do we get the, um, the pointer? So chronic pain is 72%, PTSD 13%. And I think PTSD is a little underrepresented here because in Maine, we have a specific list of conditions for which we can certify a patient for medical cannabis. And just two years ago, with the help of Ryan Began, who's here, and some other activists and myself in Maine, we added PTSD to that list. But prior to that, a lot of patients that we were treating for chronic pain had PTSD as a comorbidity. And they would tell us, yes, this helps with the pain, but it helps even more with the PTSD symptoms. And um, hep nausea, hepatitis C, cancer, uh, seizure disorders, inflammatory bowel disease. It's a whole mix. Um, and so this is what I wanted to talk about today. Number one, uh, this is an emerging specialty field. And then we'll talk about the cannabis constituents with their broad mechanisms of action. And we're not going to do an in-depth uh, coverage of those, but just some new and interesting, exciting things that I've been looking at lately. And then the big question that everyone wants to talk about is dosage, and I think that is a huge question that can tie together what we've heard from the other speakers today about is cannabis helping or is it hurting, and how do patients know how to use this medicine without good role models or without doctors or healthcare providers that are able to teach them how to do so. Uh, we'll talk about bidirectional effects, individual responses, and uh, if there's time at the end, delivery systems. So first of all, this is an emerging specialty field. It doesn't matter as a medical provider what our background or our training might be. If we are willing to talk about cannabis with our patients, if we are willing to dig into this preclinical and early clinical research and apply that to the patients we're seeing, then we are going to be attracting patients from all walks of life. And if you're not ready for it, get ready because pediatric seizure patients are going to be coming in and elderly patients with dementia and hospice and everything in between. This is a very broad scope of practice that cannabinoid medicine fosters. And it's incredibly rewarding. I would have never been exposed to this level of interesting case and pathology without having them uh, come into my practice for cannabis. Um, uh, we're often seeing the most challenging and refractory cases in the field. So when everything else has failed, guess who's, who's coming in looking for cannabis? This, these are great teachers. You know, my patients are my teachers. And by listening to them and observing them and understanding what's working and what's not working, uh, we can learn a whole lot that's going to help a lot of people globally. The essentials for good practice of cannabinoid medicine, number one, a high standard of care. Your chart notes, the way you interact with your patients, for the medical providers that are here and for the patients that are seeing those providers, this has to stand up to critique from your peers and from the licensing boards and from the whole rest of the medical field because we want to make this a substantial, a valid aspect of medicine because we want to be able to help people. And so to do that, we have to have a high standard of care. Cannabinoid medicine also requires an integrative medicine paradigm. Most of us, even if we're osteopaths, um, maybe not if we're naturopaths though, have very little training on how to use botanicals. We have very little training on substances that have these wide, safe, effective dosing ranges and um, other aspects like bidirectional and biphasic dose response effects, which I'll explain in greater depth in a few slides. So um, systems and complexity theory, we don't have time to get into that now, but it's an understanding that health isn't simple cause and effect. And it's not all magic bullet drugs that have a single mechanism of action that can then create a, a positive outcome. In fact, most of those drugs create a lot of side effects that we then have to deal with. So when we step back and we think about instead of direct cause and effect, we want to look at the system of a human being as so complex that we can start to identify certain trends and look at what's happening and then apply those uh, observations to our other patients without being so fixated on really pretending that we know everything and that we understand everything. Because when we start pretending that, we're going to miss a whole lot that's happening right under our noses. Uh, openness to new information and critical thinking. And I think all of us can be guilty of dismissing ideas as, no, that's not 
possible, and, and then it, it sneaks around to come back again and show us, yes, this is actually effective. This is actually working in patients I would have never believed it before. But then again, on the other side of that coin, a lot of people in this field, both medical providers and lay providers who are uh, put into the position of making recommendations to patients, whether they're bud tenders or growers, uh, we find uh, a lot of times that they have a successful case, and now suddenly they know what's going to work for everyone, and that becomes the new gospel in the field. And we have to be really cautious about that, believing that what works for one person is going to work for everyone. We have to stay open-minded and think critically. Uh, and finally, patient education. That's just really what this comes down to. It's not about healthcare providers telling patients what to do. It's about us empowering patients to continue to figure this out and how to get the right dosage, the right delivery system, the right strains, and to get the best possible outcomes. I really think the core of this work is patient education. So let's Move on. Cannabis constituents. A lot of us are familiar with the decarboxylated cannabinoids, THC and CBD are the ones that get the most attention and um, have the most research behind them. I've been surprised lately to learn about just how effective some of the raw cannabinoids can be. And I'm certainly not the pioneer of this work, but I've, I've been turned on to it. I've kind of stumbled into it in my practice, and it is um, a really exciting frontier. So I want to spend a little time uh, on that so that you all can spend some time on that when you go home. Uh, terpenoids are another component of the plant that have these broad acting effects. Um, and uh, of course, Ethan Russo wrote a great paper that really summarizes that to make it accessible to all of us. Um, so to fully understand the clinical utility, careful observation must be paired with laboratory analysis. In my office in Falmouth, Maine, we have a HPLC, a high pressure liquid chromatographer, um, that is analyzing the medicines that patients bring in so that we can start to understand, first of all, how many milligrams they're getting when they're dosing themselves and what constituents of the cannabis are effective. Observation is the most basic form of uh, science, observation of nature. And so when we start to actually find out what's working out in the field, that can inform the rest of our practice and it can also inform experimental design like what's happening here. I think we need both observational and experimental research to really get what's happening here and make the best of it. Uh, so CBD mechanisms of action, everyone wants to know how CBD works. Of course, it's not a simple answer. Um, it's, it's too complex for this short talk, but just to kind of open your mind to it a little bit, there's, um, uh, it inhibits some of the agonist activity of um, THC and the other CB1 and CB2 agonists. Uh, so it's actually decreasing the affinity at the CB1 receptor, but it's doing so much else. It's antagonizing some of these receptors. It's activating some of the other re receptors. These are both within the so-called cannabinoid system and outside, like the serotonin receptor and the PPAR gamma receptor, which is another really interesting system. It's inhibiting the reuptake of several neurotransmitters. So we think of like an SSRI inhibiting the reuptake of serotonin. Well, CBD is doing that with a lot of different neurotransmitters, inhibiting the activity of the enzyme that breaks down our endocannabinoid, anandamide, and so forth. Broad, broad mechanisms of action. The reason why I'm showing this is because we need to think about this differently than how we think about other drugs and other medicines and their potential effect on our physiology. I guarantee that whatever we think we know about CBD, there's a whole lot that we still don't know as well, and we have to be open to that. The raw cannabinoids, though, really exciting for me. This started because I had a pediatric seizure patient whose mom brought in this bottle of tincture that was working. She was under the impression it was a CBD-dominant tincture. Uh, we ran it through our, our analytical machine, and it told us there's no CBD in there, and there's no THC in there. It's all THCA in there. And then I finally started believing, okay, THCA may have some anticonvulsant properties. Discoveries like that in the field are so essential, and now I've got a lot of patients using THCA where CBD has failed to control seizures. Uh, so the raw cannabinoids are non-psychoactive, but they have some really cool effects that have been demonstrated in animal models. First of all, uh, quite safe. So large doses in um, uh, different uh, types of rodents had no psychoactive effects. Um, and it was, uh, THCA was shown to suppress tumor, tumor necrosis factor alpha, which is an uh, inflammatory mediator that causes a lot of 
different uh, inflammatory processes in the body. It had superior antiemetic activity to THC in rats at this incredibly low dosage, 0.05 milligrams per kilogram. In the same model of nausea, THC was effective at 10 times that dose. But THCA was effective not only at one-tenth that dose, but also at the same dose as THC. The THCA was not metabolized into THC. And the in vitro studies support a non-CB1 receptor dependent mechanism of action. So here you see the vehicle, uh, which is no drug, the control group, you see a, a very, very low dose of THC. This would be the equivalent of like just taking a little pinch off of a raw bud and eating it and having a strong anti-nausea effect from it um, if there's GI absorption, which hasn't really been looked at. Uh, and then the, um, a 10 times that dose of THCA didn't really do any better than the low dose, and the ultra-low dose of THC had no effect on this model of nausea. Um, THCA and CBDA, uh, the raw cannabinoids, are also COX inhibitors. This is another anti-inflammatory mechanism, and uh, especially CBDA is a potent COX-2-specific inhibitor that's comparable to the uh, pharmaceutical medications we use to treat arthritis. So again, raw cannabinoids, non-psychoactive, a lot of potential, very powerful, not a lot of research. We need more. PPARs, I'm not really going to go into that, but I just found it so uh, fascinating that the cannabinoids aren't only acting on the cell membrane, they're also going into the cell and stimulating receptors that live on the cell nucleus. And these receptors, specifically the PPARs, control the expression of genes that regulate inflammation and uh, pain and other, um, other uh, cell differentiation, energy metabolism, and homeostasis. So uh, just like the endocannabinoid system, which has really uh, broad acting effects throughout the body and physiology, come on now. Um, this is just a simple diagram of PPAR gamma, both THC and CBD are PPAR agonists. And you can see different functions in different tissues around the body. It's probably too small for you to read, but my point is that broad, broad mechanisms of action throughout all the different organs and tissues of the body. This, these are holistic medicines, and nobody is going to be able to tell a patient, here is your precise dose that's going to work best for you. That's my point here. This is too complex for that kind of reductionistic thinking. So what we have to do instead is help educate patients on the trends that we see that are effective and put it in their hands and then get feedback from them. So uh, just to orient people to uh, general dosages, one large inhalation may deliver about a milligram and a half of THC. There's a wide range based on the potency and the size of the puff and the bioavailability, but these are kind of averages. The oral dosing range effective in my practice, I mean, so this is a 500-fold range. You don't see this with any other medicine that you could give one dose that's effective and safe and then 500 times that dose that's effective and safe. It's unheard of, but it's really nice as a clinician when I'm experimenting with patients and things that haven't been studied thoroughly in humans to know that I'm not going to hurt them uh, if I follow some basic precautions. Um, it's non-lethal. You know, monkeys given 9,000 milligrams per kilogram didn't die. Uh, we're going to finish this up here, but one of the most interesting factors I've found about the uh, dosing and response of cannabis is what's called a biphasic and triphasic dose response curve. And you can see this in a lot of the animal models. This is their locomotor activity. And at low doses, their activity level goes down. Then as you increase the dose, activity level goes up. And then as you increase the dose some more, activity level goes back down again. We see this not just with activity in humans, but I see this with pain and PTSD symptoms. And really, whatever people are trying to treat with cannabis, there's usually some optimal dosages and, oops, and sorry, and some uh, dosages that don't work so well. And very often, we see patients coming in who have taught themselves to use cannabis, and they're here. And then we actually get them to reduce their dose, and they get better effects from it. Um, my time is just about up here, but I'm just going to, if I can advance the slide, give you a couple examples. Oh, another, another study on nabiximols showed that the low dose, four puffs, decreased pain a whole lot. But the higher dose, 10 puffs, decreased pain only a little compared to placebo. And the highest dose, 
had almost the same effect as, as placebo. So again, less can be more with cannabis. And this is a message I've been putting out there a lot. Less isn't always more, less isn't best for everyone, but for a lot of people, reducing dose will actually improve their response. I'm gonna skip this, a study on neuropathic pain that showed low dose and high dose cannabis had equal effects. Um, and that also the con other constituents of the plant can change this biphasic dose response. So this is a very recent study that showed CBD had a biphasic dose response in animals, both in a pain model and in an inflammation model. But when that CBD was combined with the rest of the plant, it shifted that biphasic dose response or maybe got rid of it entirely. It's not on this chart anymore. And now you can see a more dependable dose response curve. So it's not just about the milligrams of the active constituents, it's about all the other parts of the plant combined, the entourage effect that you've all been hearing about. Um, so when in our practice, we start patients off very low. And cannabis naive patients are most likely to have side effects. You guys have all heard the story of somebody that eats too much of the edible and has this terrible experience and it ruins their whole you know, relationship with cannabis. Starting subtherapeutic and then titrating up works really well. Um, for experienced patients, as I mentioned, uh, uh, we have a protocol that can actually get them to reduce their dose, and it takes six days. The, I can give you the details of it, or you can find it online, but basically, uh, this is before, this is after, a dose reduction of 56%, and people that are using less get equal or greater benefits from this lower dose. So this is really possible to save money and save resources and get better effects uh, keeping this in mind. So I teach patients about the biphasic dose response curve. I teach them about bidirectional effects. So the same herb in one person could cause anxiety and another person can relieve anxiety, can make symptoms better and make symptoms worse. Also within the same person, they could have one herb that helps them uh, with their symptoms and one herb that makes the symptoms much worse. Delivery systems can change that too using the same exact preparation. So, um, and cannabis use history can complicate that clinical response. So I'm gonna end because my time is up, but what I really wanna emphasize here, and I think I've said this enough, this is complex stuff. Don't assume that you can know everything, even if you have one successful case. For the medical providers in the room, please teach your patients about things like biphasic dose response curve and help them understand and empower themselves to work with their relationship with cannabis, figure out what is serving them the best, and then report that back to you so that you can bring it back to the rest of us and we can continue to move this uh, movement and this new emerging clinical field forward and really help solve some major issues of humanity and help uh, improve the wellness of our species. Thank you. Another great presentation. Uh, I have to agree with his comments about people who pretend to know everything because they're a great annoyance to those of us who do. Uh, so our next speaker, I promise you, as a subject that you'll all be interested in, is how do we study medical cannabis patients in states that, where they have access to products, products which are tested for their variability in laboratories. So please give a warm round of applause for Dr. Michelle Sexton. Thanks for having me. It's always good to follow on uh, Dustin's heels because we think a lot alike and our practices are a lot alike with regard to treating the whole person. But what I was going to talk about today, and um, anyway, I don't have my slides up yet. Oh, there it is. So I, I put this, um, this cover from Time on there because uh, you heard Carrie Boyder talking about what's going on in Washington. And she didn't go into some of the really horrible specifics of a particular bill that has passed the Senate and is waiting to pass through the House, and the governor has said he will sign. But just as one example, they, they were going to put this requirement on doctors to make an objective assessment of pain. And so I don't know how many pain specialists are in the room, but obviously other people find that laughable because this has been something that has eluded science and medicine for a really long time. There isn't a machine out there that's a reliable indicator of an individual's pain. This is an objective measurement. And so this it just piques my interest because I was a midwife first. I didn't care about the laws. I cared about the people that I was caring for. 
Um, and, you know, the, the same thing sort of happened when I started treating patients who were using cannabis. I really cared about them, what they had to say, what their experience was, and whether they told me, along with my clinical assessment, if they were getting better or not. And in the case of cannabis, often it comes down to quality of life. And whose right is it to measure somebody else's quality of life? And I, I think only the patient can say that. So here's just, I, I'm gonna show you sort of a different side of, of research. So when I wanted to go out and study cannabis, I realized I was never gonna be able to do it in the existing framework, through institutions, the systems. And you know, I always had seen it as a botanical medicine, so I was already familiar with how we use botanical medicines and where the body of knowledge came from. It came from what we call Materia Medica, and this was observations of doctors and herbalists who had used plants and watched the plant-human relationship and made notes about it. And so this is what we've been doing with cannabis because of it, prohibition. Um, there is citizen medicine and there's citizen science going on. And, you know, I think we have to take note of that and be, be willing to learn from it. So I just did a little search to see, because I hear people making claims all the time. They, they make claims like it, it treats this or that. And you heard what um, APA's general counsel had to say. Tony Young said about that yesterday. You know, so there's people being called out all the time by the FDA for making claims about dietary supplements, uh, herbs, and I even found one today of uh, like cosmetic products claiming you know improvements to skin even. So they'll they'll look for anything. And then I hear a lot of lay people saying, "I'm doing research," and I think you know we even need to be careful with that data because you're not supposed to do human subjects research without. Uh, working under certain guidelines. So it might be better to say, I'm collecting data and uh, just watch the language a little bit. But, you know, here's some of the things I found today that it cures cancer. It's proven to be the best treatment for Lyme disease. Lyme disease is a really tough one, if, in case you don't know that. I found this on WebMD, which I was surprised. Doctors may prescribe mar medical marijuana to treat. I'm like, who wrote this for WebMD? And then they give all these things that doctors can treat uh, using cannabis. And then um, this last one, I couldn't even, there, I had to make the print so little because these are all the conditions that cannabis could cure. So, you know, if, if you're not gonna, if you, wanna, if you want it to be a drug, you have to follow those pathways. And I think you've already heard about those pathways today. A lot of herbs don't want to be drugs. There are some companies I, I'm, I'm speaking on behalf of the uh, botanical world now, but um, I've been involved with herbs for a really long time, and there's a ton of really nice, effective herbs out there. And I, I like to think of cannabis as a gateway herb, and, you know, there's, <laughs> there are other herbs that people can be led to the, the larger herbal world by coming to cannabis first. So... Um, you know, there's the National Research Act. You have to go through an institutional review board. If you're going to get any public health system money, you have to, even if you're not, you have to go through an IRB. You have to have an independent body. Make sure that you're not going to take advantage of patients. So, you know, if, if you want to do a clinical investigation, anything involving a test article. So if you want to take it through that process, you know, you have to start at the beginning with the good manufacturing and, and everything else to get the product to that point where the FDA might even take a look at it someday. And we hope the FDA will take a look at things other than NIDA produced materials eventually, but I, I, with a group of people, have tried it and other people have tried it and it's not happening yet. So, you know, if, if you can't get approval for locally accessed product, you can't do any clinical trials, period. And and actually, you know, it's not a generally recognized as safe um, product either. So those are sometimes exempt for some of the uh, FDA rules. But uh, the Hemp Association has tried to get hemp as grass, and I don't think that it's all the way through the grass process yet. So cannabis has a long way to go, and we don't know if it will ever be there or not. So here's a policy. This is also reflected at Bastyr University, where I, I have an affiliation. So they said... Uh, researchers can do observational trials, um, observational research clinical guidance, but there's no administering marijuana. 
uh, and you have to comply with all these policies. So basically, we can't do research on people accessing local product, which is what I was really interested in as a form of ethnography. So what I learned is that, hey, guess what? I can report what patients have to say about what they're accessing locally. And um, this is really gaining a lot of attention. In fact, there's a whole toolkit that's been developed that was funded by our federal government. And so if you can just see what it says, um, clinical outcome measures have minimal immediate relevance to the day-to-day -day function of patients with chronic diseases. So, I mean, we could met, take lab tests and do MRIs, but it means nothing to the patient who's suffering on a daily basis being incapacitated with something. And often the way, best way patients can judge effectiveness um, is by telling their doctor. So I wanted to illustrate this by telling you about when I gave a talk at the International Cannabinoid Research Society meeting describing these families that were administering cannabidiol-rich um, extract to their kids, and I showed, um, you know, what, what did the parents, what did the parents report was happening? And the parents were reporting seizure reduction. The parents were reporting that their child spoke for the first time. The, chi the child who used to ride his bike can now ride his bike again. The child who had never eaten food orally was eating. And I had a researcher come up to me afterward and said, well, we, we really need to prove this is working. So I, I went back to the parents and I said, so when your doctor prescribes a new anti-epileptic drug, how does the doctor tell if that drug's being effective or not? I tell them. <laughs> they ask the parent. Some, I think sometimes parents and even doctors are using seizure tracker, but often it's just the parent report. And I thought, how odd that that's okay for other drugs, but something that's working for their child, they're obviously biasly reporting that cannabis is working. So that just rubbed me the wrong way. Um, and we use some of this Promise toolkit. So these are, the t these are a bunch of tools. You can go to the Promise website. You can download the tools. If you're a researcher, you can use the tools. And the cool thing about these tools is that you can take the data and you can score it based on the general population that they tested all these tools on. So these are validated questionnaires that you can administer um, to patients, have patients self-report. So they did all of the internal validation work on it. Um, so we used this approach in a survey that we instituted through Bastyr University and the Center for the Study of Cannabis and Research Policy, and I just wanted to show you a little bit about it. So we wanted to report quality of life, and we chose to use the Promise tools to do that. And also some other things. Uh, we had 2,265 responders. Uh, we, for this study, we only looked at those who, were met, who identified as only being medical users. Um, they were answered from 18 countries, but 88% were in the U.S. And this is just demographics. I'm not going to go into all this. They were, you know, it's pretty broad demographics. Uh, generally, though, their income was pretty low. So these are people accessing cannabis who already don't have much money. Um, this was really interesting data because uh, we weren't, we didn't have, we'll have to go back in and see how many were actually in Washington. But in Washington, anxiety and depression are not conditions for which cannabis can be used. So we thought this was really interesting to learn from patients. What do they say that they use cannabis for? And, and this, this is not uh, chronic intractable pain, which is actually what is on the list uh, for acceptable use in Washington State. So I, I, think, I think all of this should go away. I don't think we should have to add conditions to this list. I think the endocannabinoid system, the basic science, the preclinical data shows us that there is applicable for many, many disease states. And this should be between the doctor and the patient. So how much were they, they're mostly smoking it. So, you know, for states that want to take away smokables, patients are almost always smoking in one form or another. I think we need to educate more about the value of um, vaporizing the whole plant. And then how, how, how many inhalations were they using? You can see that more than 10 was the most often response, but most of them were, you know, three, four, five, or six inhalations per session. How often, um, times per day, these, this amount was all day, every day. Uh, <laughs> and then, you know, one to four times per day was the most common response. 
And then how much? Um, so, you know, anywhere between, not only 10% were using less than a gram, and this was per week, um, but most of them were, you know, using probably around a gram a day. So when we asked them how they shopped for their medicine, and they could, they could select more than one response, um, but often they're just following their nose, and this is what I've told patients to do for a long time. And unfortunately in Washington State in the recreational system, everything's under glass and prepackaged, and it's really difficult to smell it now. So that would be really bad for patients if they have to get into that system. And so anyway, we took our Promise Global scores, and so these are all the things that they answer. They answer questions about general health, physical health, everyday function, pain, fatigue, those are the physical health items. And then quality of life, mental health, social satisfaction, social discretionary, and emotional problems. And these are the raw scores, and then you take them and compare them to the general population. And what we found out about our population was that they scored exactly on average for mental health with a, with a general population. So these are people that are suffering from pain, depression and anxiety often, which may be going along with their pain. But yet, they're, for their mental health, they're functioning really well. And, and for their physical health, they were just one standard deviation below the general population, which we thought was pretty good for people that had disabilities or uh, suffering. And then we like this data. We asked them to score their um, improvements. So zero would have been no change, negative five, a worsening of symptoms, positive five, improvement. And the average here was about 88. The number was 88% improvement. And you can see that there was a, a range um, nausea, and what was the other one? Headache and arthritis, they all, they all had the lowest variability. So how can we shift this focus from saying, you know, we have to follow this old paradigm, which is reflected in what's called the evidence, oh, this isn't it yet, sorry. Um, so this was our conclusion. Uh, regarding the global health scores, we report that pa patients are finding cannabis to be effective for a range of symptoms and conditions and doesn't appear to be associated with any deficits of mental health. So, you know, there's a lot of questions about mental health and cannabis use, so we need to look at this even more. So what I started thinking about, and I, I totally made this up. I'm just going to tell you that right off the bat. I, this is probably this is my own bias about, you know, pharmaceuticals, because I've never used drugs since I was about 17 years old. My kids have never had any pharmaceutical medications. And, and this is the way I see the system working, that pharmaceutical companies have a lot of money, and they stand to benefit from taking a, a single-agent pharmaceutical that they can patent to market. So who, who is really being thought about? Well, we know they're thinking somewhat about the patient because they've designed the drug. They're thinking about regulators because they get it through the regulatory process. And then, you know, you've got to think about your shareholders because everybody wants to make money, right? You've, had, you've got investors. So, you know, this is sort of the framework. And then what I'm thinking is, is there a way to shift the focus so that it really becomes more about the patient, you know? And, and not so much about who's making money off of it. And, and the patient and clinician relationship. And you know, how do we deepen that relationship? How do we learn to trust our doctors? How do we learn to trust our patients? It's by communication. So this is the evidence hierarchy that everybody has, you know, this is like the entrenched way of thinking. This is how drug development has happened. And this, this is never fit for naturopathic medicine, for herbal products, because they don't fit into the same framework. And this is when I first met Steph Shearer, and she was saying, we need randomized controlled clinical trials. I, I said, no, 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 we don't. <laughs> this is an herb, you know? And so there's different pathways, and we do need those. We need drugs that insurance companies will pay for. There's gonna be people who will never use it as an herb. I want, you know, if somebody goes, if my mother winds up in the ER with a stroke, I wish she could get CBD, you know, that would be the drug of choice I would want her to have. She can't have that right now, but we have to go through this whole series, you know, starting with the test tube, and then we got to show it in animals and blah, 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 and you know the whole thing. And, and I even saw one website that said the best evidence is at the top of the pyramid. But not everybody thinks this way anymore. There's a lot of challenge to what is evidence-based medicine anymore. And so, you know, here's just a, another example that there's parallel evidence, there is that direct evidence, but there's other evidence and we have to take it all in effect. 
into account as clinicians along with our clinical experience and we have to make sure we can apply it to the actual person sitting across from us. So I'm going to just now end by telling you a little bit more about the uh, cannabis monograph. I think we already talked about the, the first piece that came out, Washington State adopted this. This usually all comes out in one document. Um, the only other monograph Roy Upton at the American Herbal Pharmacopeia has made. Well, how about you guess? What, what plant would you, if you know, don't say it, but let's hear a couple of guesses. What plant do you think has more data on it than cannabis? Corn. Corn. What about an herb, one that's used as a medicine? Ephedra, garlic, it's garlic. Somebody got it right. So yeah, gar the only bigger one, and I don't even know if the garlic one ever got published, but it, it had more data. So this is the second piece, the therapeutic compendium. And so if you want to think more about doing clinical research, and as we move forward, as that becomes more possible, and you want to know what's the, what's the scoop, we tried to really just focus on clinical studies. We didn't report any synthetic compounds in here that was all as much whole plant medicine as we could come up with in the literature. So these are all the authors and reviewers. There's several people here in this room. And these are, these are all the areas that are covered. These are the expert reviewers that go back through every single article uh, or anything that we repurposed for the monograph. So it, you'll see it laid out this way. It's gonna start with sort of that evidence pyramid uh, that it'll be case reports or case series where there's maybe six or eight people that a doctor reported on any kind of surveys or pilot studies. And then if there's preclinical or animal, animal data that we thought was relevant, we included that. And then in the end, we, we wrote a conclusion. So for instance, if you were interested in what is there out there on cannabis and Parkinson disease, for instance, you could go to the Parkinson or movement disorders section. And at the end, there will be a conclusion where we'll sum up in an unbiased way what the literature had to say that we reviewed. And you'll also be able to see a list of all of the clinical studies or a table. So if you want to go look up any of those individual ones that we reviewed, you can do that as well. So it'll be a great tool uh, for helping to guide research, for educating physicians and caregivers, for educating patients, for educating regulators. And there are uh, forms. I put some on the table. The rest are at the OPA table that you can pre-order this document. It should be out at the very latest by the end of the summer. So th thanks again to uh, Bastyr University that was my collaborator on the survey. We have some other publications that will come out of that survey. And thank you all for your attention. All right. Thank you very much. Please give another round of applause for our panelists, Dr. Sue Sisley, Dr. Miller, Dr. Sulak, and Dr. Sexton. Uh, yeah, I, I, uh, I'd say cannabis opened up a whole new field for me. Now I can't get enough lavender and chamomile into my diet. But, uh, but so this is the end of the panel. Please, please come back at 4. I know many of you might have plans around 4 o'clock, but if there was a group of people I could spend 4.20 with, it'd be Steph Shear, Ethan Russo, Michael McGuffin, Eric Steenstra, and Bill Piper. So please come back at 4 sharp for the Harmonization of Legalization and Pharmaceutical Sciences panel. Thank you so much.